Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. Um, as you can see behind me, I, I took an evening, so this is more of a sunset, not necessarily a wake up, more of a time to go to bed, Missoula kind of look behind me right now. So we're going to jump right in and talk about some things, but I also wanted to mention, don't forget that we are having a solar eclipse um, pass through the North American Hemisphere. Um, it's going to be on October 14th. I'm going to remind you again next week because it'll be the last time I'll be able to remind you before the uh, solar eclipse at 10.20 roughly a.m. Mountain Standard Time, which is only eight days away from uh, hopefully when you're seeing this live. Missoula is spiking in COVID cases according to our collective poop. Uh, wastewater was able to detect a byproduct of people who have COVID by sampling the wastewater in the millions. Um, and it uses the RNA uh, byproduct from COVID. When you uh, get COVID, go to the bathroom. This is what happens. This is part of uh, folks getting sick and not testing or reporting themselves having got COVID. It's kind of like, you know, you know, people keep on stealing from the cookie jar. And then you when your parents finally confront you, you're just like, by the way, we had a camera on the cookie jar the whole time. That's basically how this kind of feels. So it's kind of like it shows you that people are getting used to the COVID-19 virus and are resuming their activities like normal. Cindy Farr from the health department said respiratory illness typically increases in the fall. Health officials are asking members of the public to report positive at home COVID testing to the Department of Health and Human Services, enabling it to track the virus strength within the population. The health department just wants to collect data and mitigate the spread of COVID this season. People are gathering indoors now and will only increase as schools are getting closer to their holiday season. So speaking of gatherings, the UAW expanded their strike by more than 7,000 last Friday, um, you know, always after my show because they do some kind of big announcement. And speaking of big announcements, they're doing another announcement this afternoon, probably around the time this replays. This is be kind of old hat news in terms of what's going on. So we're going to throw back when we talk about it. Uh, words can only uh, take them so far. And Union President Sean Fain told workers in the video appearance that the strike were escalated but, uh, because Ford and GM refused to make meaningful progress on an ongoing contract talks. Jeep maker Stellanus was spared from a third round of strikes just this last week uh, because of, of some consensus on cost of living wages. You think it's bad in Missoula. These are the kinds of unrealistic costs of living in larger cities, which drives up them to smaller communities like Missoula and the rest of the states. Uh, GM manufacturers uh, chief said that the union was calling more strikes just for the headlines, not real progress. The GM plant in Delta Township near Langsing uh, makes large crossover SUVs such as the Chevrolet Traverse and Buick Enclave. A nearby metal parts uh, stamping plant with 300 workers will remain open, Fain said. The Chicago Ford plant makes the Ford Explorer and Explorer uh, police interceptors as well as the Lincoln Aviator SUV. The Explorer Interceptor is the nation's top selling police vehicles. And then, like I said, there's going to be that announcement this afternoon and seeing what uh, places they're going to expand the st strike, standing orders, and all that kind of stuff. And so far, GM estimated that this strike has cost their company $200 million in the last two weeks alone. This was a report by CNN on Wednesday. The UAW is waging targeted strikes against uh, not just GM, but also its rivals Ford and Stellanos. Uh, which builds vehicles for the U.S. market under the Jeep, Ram, Dodge, and Chrysler brand. Neither Ford or Stellantis um, would disclose the amount of their losses from the strike when asked. The third quarter of GM says that they're up by 21% in sales, mostly because they raise their prices. Every week um, is costing these companies millions of dollars, and the strike fund isn't taking a hit as a uh, to hit as specific areas are being targeted by these strikes to make maximum impact. I mean, and I think that's pretty much working. Uh, uh, the narration of consumer uh, taking the brunt of the cost also should be known that they raised the prices during the pandemic to the point where even used cars went up as in value as a result. The only way that this can be sustainable is for owners and CEOs to take the pay cut with the uh, couple pay cuts, especially with their bonuses that could cover thousands of employees that need the extra change. But the owners most likely in the end raise all prices and erode support for unions as the tactics have been common in struggles with the working class. So back to Montana, schools are being looked at in terms of minimizing the budget while still living up to the equalization, which is part of our constitution in the state of Montana, which essentially uh, distributes funds to schools benefiting smaller town schools. So part of this is that the state of Montana want, uh, is being sued, that, uh, that, that this might be threatened as the state looks to cut taxes wherever they can find it. And so far, schools count for $1 per $1,000 that even 
comes from property taxes. According to the Missoula Current, the state is looking to uh, have a judge declare how many mills the state is required uh, to levy for school equalization according to the lawsuit. Most of this has to do with the fact that most properties appraisal has uh, has basically gone up by 46% more in value, hence taxes go up for $100,000 that your home is worth. So the story also asked the questions that the state had the uh, $2 billion surplus and yet taxes keep going up. This lawsuit will be a place where Montana finances will be out there and laws can be changed to update property owners versus businesses on how their taxes are collected. Otherwise, we will follow the kind of the idea of how California Proposition 13 went, which uh, schools eroded in poor areas, which gave rise to gangs to the 80s and 90s that haven't necessarily recovered, especially now since people are moving out of the state of California. Uh, Partnership Health in Missoula is also looking to expand mental health services at MCPS schools here in Missoula. They, were orga they are an organization that covers mental health issues that spring up from the mobile crisis unit that was uh, launched during the pandemic to help mitigate some people who have a mental health crisis so they can give follow-up to folks rather than the uh, basically the use of uh, police officers who are only there to control the situation, but not necessarily uh, control the people in those situations. So these mobile crisis uh, units have been uh, instrumental in helping people with the essential follow-up to any kind of mental health crisis moving forward. So this is a $350,000 grant through federal funds through the schools, uh, CS Porter Middle School and Franklin Elementary Schools, as rates of suicide have doubled in the state of Montana according to national rates. 40% of high school students have reported feeling sad and hopeless according to the Public Instructions 2021 Montana Youth Risk Behavior Survey. But then again, you gotta understand that the pandemic is kind of at its end and 2021 survey was very much at the height of the pandemic where everyone was extremely scared and frightened of this situation what was going on as well. So it's not fun living in these days in general with the cost of living and hope of financial independence keeps getting further and further away from sustainability in Missoula. So speaking of sustainability, uh, looks like solar panels are uh, being added in Dillon, Montana around a 80 megawatt power provided by Northwestern Energy. This is part of the August opening of the 600 acre plant in Dillon, Montana. They got the numbers down and they were able to uh, provide 80 watts that covers 13,500 homes in the Dillon area. Winter is coming and those solar hours will be affected. I know because I have my own solar panels on my home um, and I might get maybe one to maybe five uh, kilowatt hours on on any cloudy day and you know that's still pretty low um, uh, essentially. So let, up next Here's some highlights of the best parts of the uh, homecoming parade, the bands. This year's homecoming celebration, they are excited to be part of Ghost Football and look forward to joining the game day atmosphere in the greatest show in Montana. The Grizzly Marching Band is under the direction of Dr. Kevin Griggs and assisted by graduate students Sean Steneford and Elora Do Elora Dawson. The drum line directed by Hannah Ramson. Leading the band are drum majors Ben DeBar and Ellie Benzura. The band is 125 members strong and membership is open to students. Marching with alumni in their 20s through 90s, the alumni band has been going strong over 30 years. Join them in singing Up With Montana and Hail Copper.
plays traditional Balinese music. The group includes UM administrators, UM faculty, UM students, and community members. Today, the group is performing marching gamelan typically seen in Bali during festivals. Mazuma Community Gamelan. From Florence Car Carlton High School, marching band, the Falcons. Back. I also want to give props to all those kids out there who uh, managed the uh, uh, the rain that was constantly bombarding everyone during the homecoming parade. Maybe that has to do with a lot of the uh, uptick in sickness going around here in uh, the city of Missoula as well. So we're going to jump right in. We're going to talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. It's time for Pre-Critic, where I pre-judge a movie based on absolutely nothing but my pre-biases towards movies in general. Kicking things off is The Exorcist. Belieber, um, we have a movie in the world of exorcists trying to deal with little girls possessed by demons. Unlike the original, this time it has two possessions at the same time. Um, welcome to the world of kids saying the damnedest things as they want to believe our misbehaved kids are possessed rather than putting them on Adderall. Um, <laughs> I'm not advocating for drug use for children. Anyways, the Royal Hotel, you can just smell the coming of age uh, um, romance thing in this movie just like the poster it's great but it turns out it's like don't go to small towns or you're gonna die from death and like the the, the towns folks so u.s backpackers hannah hannah and Liv take jobs in a remote australian pub for some extra scratch and are confused with a bunch of unruly locals and situation that grows rapidly out of control so this kind of follows the path of it was just a normal journey for these two girls looking for adventure and just because we can we will make their lives suffer for your amusement. Then we have Foe. I cannot wait for the uh, sequel, Fum, and the prequel, uh, Fi. Uh, enjoy a movie that takes Foe to the next level when you have an isolated farmhouse, mm -hmm, only for a stranger to make you think that anyone coming over uninvited is a murderer and you shouldn't trust people. But actually, this turns out to be a weird sci-fi movie where they uh, get this couple to go on a space farm and do some farm stuff. F don't forget, it's the future, but it's also like it's on a farm, so you can't really tell it's the future except for a couple shots that they use. Uh, that's a way to save a budget. Then finally, we got Cat Person. In the vein of couples needing therapy or an uncoupling, or an uncoupling breakup, comes Cat Person. This is all about long distance dating to become a hell of a thing to pull off in person as two lonely people who are 
incompatible, try to make it work, but the girl ends up trying to kill the guy for being too weird and clingy. In the day, in the, <laughs> yeah, basically that's what the movie is. And then finally, we got Johnny Z. If you like those zombie movies with a catch, hey, we had a musical, we had a comedy, we had a rom-com, we've had probably just basic romance, we had a boy and his dog. Uh, there's a movie called Fido, it's a zombie movie, it's great. Johnny Z is basically a uh, superhero samurai, the way of, it's kind of like um, Forrest Whitaker. I know it's, I'm stretching here for movies, but like the way of the dog, but they have a zombie. So now get ready for an action zombie who is out for revenge against a company that created him. When there's a monster hero, they tend to kind of kill him off in an explosive way possible, usually with an explosion and the hero's ward slash love interest watching in the distance. It's like, they sacrificed everything just to save me. The end. All right, so up next we have a brand new dub and stuff for you guys from the 1941 film, The Face Behind the Mask. I know you said that beauty is only skin deep, but after these burns, I don't know anymore. Thick skin equals better personality. Oh man, I can't wait to hit the bars after I take this off. I'm gonna have so much fun. All the ladies are gonna be oh, staring. Yes. All the ladies are gonna love you. And I might get some to hit on me. <laughs> and don't forget, an endearing heart is worth its weight in gold. Huh? What? Shut up. Uh, you know, I just want to be able to be, you know, tolerated. I don't want to be like a, you know, somebody looks at me and just like, whoa. I want someone to be like, whoa. You know what I'm saying? That's the troublesome noise. Doctor, Doctor Dave told me to barge in here and interrupt you under the mask. Oh my god! Mm, he's definitely got no alibi. Will you guys get out of here? Oh, uh, what's the big deal? I want to know what's going on. Take this towel off here. Oh! 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 Well, maybe I should get an alibi because, ooh, U G L O I, ugh. What, what the heck is this? What, what kind of you doctor need to calm are down. you? Just stop. You're being very loud. Stop it. I'm not that ugly. Stop when you stop God, yelling. You forget you did surgery on me? Don't. No. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, he's singing. I got him, sir. No. Whoa. Oh, no. There's too many of them. Oh, I've never seen a doctor do with a wife. Do you guys need some help? Oh, no, we're geez. perfectly fine. No, just get the drugs. We needed an injection. Stat. Hurry up. You're just, dis you're just discriminating against me because I'm ugly. How dare you? I've been through a terrible accident. This is not right. This is... Ooh. Oh. Uh, well, it looks like we calmed him down for now. Hey guys, we are back, and we're talking about bears in Missoula. Kicking things off with your city council report, we have, uh, there it is. <laughs> I was like, where is it? Okay, the big thing that the city is looking up to is the boundaries in regards to waste management, and it turns out it correlates with bears, and bears getting into a lot of these trash cans, especially up the Grand Creek, Rattlesnake, and a lot of the areas on the outskirts of Missoula in general. So Shannon, the staff of the city, talks about this a little bit more um, in terms of uh, Missoula's uh, boundaries and problematic barriers. So what you're about to see will be a map of Missoula and the uh, places painted in uh, kind of like a uh, light, uh, darker yellow um, uh, is the ones where they have the problematic, problematic bear areas. So bears that get used to seeking food, uh, rewards and garbage become emboldened. They damage properties by seeking food. Um, they're more likely to be near roads and hit by cars. Uh, they create unsafe conditions for people, pets, and it is also, of course, deadly for the bears. So removing problem bears is not a solution. If garbage is still available, we're gonna get more bears that come in and start accessing it. So it really is a very reactive approach. It's not a proactive report re approach. Um, so the current bear buffer zone, uh, which is there, um, is established in the M Missoula Municipal Code. And as you can see, it is limited to the city limits. That's not large enough to keep the bears out of the city. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of developed property in the county outside the, outside the city limits going up the drainages. 
another problem with the existing rules is that uh, it requires the existing rules in municipal code do require bear resistant containers unless you're going to put your garbage out the day of service. But most people, frankly, don't have bear resistant garbage containers and they put it out the night before. And part of that is because of how early the service is, but that's also because it's convenient. It's convenient to put it out the night before. All right, as you can see here, like I was mentioning, you have Grant Creek in this bear buffer zone, then Rattlesnake takes a good chunk of it for sure. And then you can never disregard the South Hills in this general area as we go full, further down towards uh, the Miller Creek um, areas as well. I believe this area is where that new uh, Jeanette Rankin School is. Um, there's the old, the, they call it the old Walmart, and then up above here is where they quote unquote have the new Walmarts. Uh, so if you're, <laughs> if you're no, you only know you're a true Missoulian when you know which one's the old Walmart and which one's the new one. Anyways, let's go back to my notes. Um, uh, you know, speaking of, you know, I have a friend's mom who lives up in Grant Creek and they follow the rules and say, hey, you know, I put my trash out just before the garbage comes out there. I, I've never needed that. And there's a lot of people who do that. But the uh, bear buffer zone was to basically update this and just encourage people who live in those areas to have uh, bear resistant garbage cans. But it's also kind of uh, alleviating to the point where it might end up being required to pay that extra uh, cash to be able to do that. So autumn is one of the more problematic seasons. Heck, South Hills, we had a grizzly bear with a bunch of uh, cubs with her last year, and they had to be re relocated with, uh, one of them had to be euthanized because they had a gimp leg. And so, um, you know, it's one of the things is that the bears are now in their uh, pre-hibernation phase, which causes them to go into a feeding frenzy. And so when bears are eating, a lot of times they, uh, uh, have this, they, they just go, they're opportunists. You know, bears in many ways are like, kind of like the garbage men. Uh, they grab whatever food or whatever they can grab and then they just do what they need to do. So, um, James Jonkel, the bear man, talks about this from the uh, Bear Smart program and he's helped out a lot of people and come to people's houses to help educate them and preventing, um, you know, bears from, you know, eating their garbage, not to mention fallen uh, fruits and veg uh, fallen fruits and other uh, brush that uh, provide food for the bears, along with um, bird seeds, which is a big one for bears. But about two and a half weeks ago, all heck broke loose in the Missoula area. And just as an example, uh, in the rattlesnake area right now, we have three different females, uh, all with cubs. We have multiple single bears, lone bears. And sadly, uh, a portion of those bears are getting into garbage. Um, last year, you know, we had quite a few issues at some of the homeless camps. We had about 30 incidents where bears were getting into tents, accessing food. This year, we have um, one female with two young, plus we think just two individual bears that are really working the homeless camps along the river right now. Okay. And so those are just a couple of things that uh, even the homeless people are dealing with in the city of Missoula. Uh, the only thing bear management can do is capture and relocate twice before their third strike, which usually leads to euthanasia. Um, it's, it's basically how uh, Montana, Fire, Mo Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Park works. However, the zoning changes will allow the city to influence residents in these bear uh, zones to pay an extra $5 a month to pre prevent bears from getting the garbage along those problem areas. Bear Smart also wants to save as many bears' lives as they can and wants people to either get their garbage out just before pickup or get bear-proof cans that can mitigate the large issues when it comes down to the urban bear problem. Overall, this is a push to require bear-proof garbage in a bear buffer zones like the pre presentation in, uh, mentioned as well. And Shannon talks about, more about the legal precedents in the uh, bear buffer zones. Part of the concept of that, that we're hopeful of, that there's a, I think Ryan Sudbury is on and he might want to talk to the concept in general about moving away from cr cr crimes, misdemeanors to civil infractions. 
but we're also hopeful that a judge would be more willing to find somebody as part of a civil infraction, a municipal infraction, as opposed to saying you create you committed a crime, you committed a misdemeanor. And so that is something that we're hopeful for. But you know that really it, it just is in the in the court. Um, if, however, we have somebody who is just you know, it's identified as creating the problem in the neighborhood. Um, there, there's also the ability to um, have a complaint in district court and to issue a, a, to file a complaint in district court where it's more of a trial, where there's more, you know, the experts will be there to say, here's all the things that we've tried. And um, we think that we could potentially have a better outcome there it's obviously a lot of use of resources so that can't be that can't be where we start okay so they want to basically improve the bear buffer zone so they can uh, update their legalese so they can make sure that people are in compliance with uh, basically not um, feeding the bears essentially all right moving on budget and finance committee spoke about the updating the timeline to reflect that would go into the consent agenda so this is about this is procedural type stuff so the city, um, Daniel Carlino, came forward and be like, hey, I want to have um, a minimum of three weeks on committee before it's present on the consent agenda so we have a little bit more time for discussions because Daniel Carlino really wants to have an in-depth discussion about a lot of these topics and bringing in people to, for these committees as well. So Christian Jordan, city uh, council, talks a little bit more about this uh, and also with the other city uh, chiming in as well. We do have sometimes have a week off, and so and that makes I, I'm worried about scheduling during times that it's really busy. So I would like to make that friendly amendment. Yeah, I would accept that amendment. Four weeks okay. seems like a reasonable compromise. Okay. And did you have another question for Marty Amber? No. All right, Stacy. Um, Marty, when was the last time someone invoked Rule 22 that you can remember? Did you? I don't think you've invoked it. <clears throat> um, it does not come up very frequently, so I don't remember. So we're amending a rule that no one actually uses. Well, it's happened. It's happened, but not in the six years I've been on council. <clears throat> okay, and so you kind of have an idea of uh, why this was brought up, and um, Dan Carlino comes back and talks a little bit more about uh, scheduling items in regards to changes, and this is what he had to say. It's Rule 22, let's just work together and schedule things in a timely manner. And I appreciate the efforts like for that recently, um, but I, I certainly would have used Rule 22 to help get the hot team to come present. Um, last year, I just um, was unfamiliar with this rule. It was one of my first few months on council, um, and that we, we missed that that opportunity. Um, there's been a couple other things that I wasn't able to get scheduled um, within six weeks that I think this could help. Um, but overall, I hope we can just work with the committee chairs and council presidents to um, get things scheduled in a timely manner. Um, but I do think it's important that that we don't make any two council members wait months to get something on the schedule. And like, for example, last week, we only had two hours worth of meetings. I don't see why we couldn't have fit any other item in that, that day. Um, and uh, Overall, I think this is a step in the right direction to make sure that we can all represent our constituents um, and get things scheduled. All right. So Gwen Jones, uh, council president, um, does a pretty strong um actually to uh, this uh, amending of Rule 22, and this is what she had to say. All right. Either there's issues with scheduling or capacity, or why don't you do this and this, the referral, so that it's in a better place before it comes. Okay, and if you want to start talking to the committee chairs more to get more input to have better referrals that come, they're probably going to get scheduled earlier. Uh, you had a policy discussion you wanted to have on homeless where you didn't have any ideas you were bringing to the table listed in the referral. That was an issue. So I think this rule has not been used. I think the chairs honestly get your stuff onto the floor pretty darn quickly. Um, everyone has a different approach. I do a lot more work before I bring a referral so that I will have a successful result on the floor. If you just want to have discussions but not move something forward, that's a different approach. 
but I think you're getting everything onto the floor that you need. So I have no interest in changing the rule that hasn't been used and I don't see a need for it. All right. So that was the uh, overall consensus of a good chunk of the um, city staff. Uh, basically, uh, you know, so Daniel didn't get what he wanted from this meeting in the end and the change to Rule 22 will no longer be in consideration. Um, the essential long thing was to basically to Daniel was like, do your homework. Um, don't just uh, do a meeting and be like, this is the meeting. This is what we're doing. I'm like, oh, okay. Is there anything more? I don't know. That was just kind of like that, that. But to his defense, he's trying to do the best that he can and also try to, you know, bring awareness to a lot of issues happening in the city of Missoula. And it's one of those things is like, I want to be able to have these kind of discussions so we can workshop uh, um, and solve these problems rather than just um, react to what we've been doing so far. And I, and I understand where he's coming for, uh, for that one in regards to that. So uh, moving on, um, land use and planning I talked a little bit more about the floodplain at Clearwater to reflect zoning requirements at the state level. This is an update in language only, and then the city had to be in compliance with the state's laws regarding zoning. And so this had to do with the legislation session. So there just be this is that meeting was all about coming into compliance and updating the language, especially when it comes to the floodplain. And um, we're going to talk about um, housing and redevelopment, which is a pathway to removing um, housing grants as pro-housing regards a, a uh, $85 million grant to break down barriers. And the city is looking to get the $1 to $10 million cap to make uh, an impact in Missoula in terms of affordable housing. So it's essentially like the Brock CBDG grants that leverage development to create affordability. Emily harris um um, health, uh, no, um, housing and community development talks more about how Missoula can be eligible for this. So eligible activities uh, are um, planning and policy development, infrastructure and preservation. And um, essentially the ineligible activities are uh, grants cannot be made to carry out the normal operation and day to day activities of government and any activity that um, results in down zoning, which is the net decrease in allowable or actual housing is prohibited by this grant as well. All right, so part of this is the idea that they want to be able to just apply to get some more money for this kind of stuff. It's about checking boxes and if there's any way to make as much bang for the buck, then they'll be able to get into this grant money. Uh, frankly, grant funding is the only way Missoula can continue to be affordable, and I do use those air quotes loosely. Emily talks about why this grant is important to our community. Our vacancy rate has um, not been above uh, 6% in about five, almost five years, um, and a healthy rate for a, a vacancy rate is between 5 to 8%. You can see that for the last three years, ours has been under or just at 2%, which creates an immense burden on households who are moving around in the community. And vacancy is a big uh, part of why there's just not much access, especially when it comes to people who are in between places, because um, there's a difference between people who are uh, homeless, who just became homeless, and then also because, you know, there's different layers. And then when somebody who becomes chronically homeless, who it almost is like it takes a lot more work for them to get into housing, while people who are trying to rent and jumping from place to place have to go through long, arduous process in vetting situations depending upon the property management. And there's just a lot of that going on there with, with just not that many options for a lot of renters to be a part of, not to mention if they're making a little bit more than the average area income, then they're not, uh, they can't apply to a lot of these affordable installations. So it becomes kind of like a, um, you know, it really does become like very difficult for a lot of people who are, you know, they're making enough money, uh, but their, their rent and everything just gone up to a point where they're just like, I'm making good money, but I can't spend it. So 
the need for housing in Missoula has become difficult to keep up with vacancies. Why? People like Missoula and moving here. Plain and simple. Preventing displacement is the biggest issue that the city wants to tackle. And, uh, you know, I was here before the pandemic and homeless has been crazy all, uh, as those pandemic, pandemic benefits started to sunset in funding. Um, and th just uh, kind of like talking about the temporary safe outdoor space, which is um, that's um, part of the Hope Rescue Mission, uh, Sovereign Hope Church. Um, that's a big thing when they have those pallet kind of outdoor safe spaces for folks to live in. That is only funded until 2025. So those are the kind of things that are like, I was like, yeah, you know, I mean, th they have that, but there's also a lot of the stuff that's already happening in the downtown and many areas in Missoula, including the Johnson Street. So Emily shows and tells what they need to do with the money if awarded. We propose uh, dedicating a million dollars to both the landlord liaison and the strategies to impact households who are experiencing systemic racism. So $2 million total land acquisitions will um, be directed at $2.5 million hybrid and cooperative land trust at $1.5 million resident owned conversions at 1.5 million uh, expiring preservation at 2.1 million and admin and personnel at 325,000. And then this grant doesn't require a match, but it does encourage project leverage and you're rated and scored on the percentage of leverage that you can bring to the project. Uh, we're currently estimating bringing 50 per, over 50% of leverage, which scores us the maximum points, but yeah, and part of that was the main point is that they, you know, when it comes to grant funding, they don't just give you money just like that. You have to put your own skin in the game to prove that the money is going to go a long ways. So it's about maximum, maximum effect. And a lot of times the city is good about leveraging some of the funds that they already have set aside for this kind of thing to help get and potentially double it. And in some cases, you can get as much as uh, $13 million with the build grant, which the Mullen area is using to uh, build out infrastructure. And not to mention a lot of th uh, fees will are going up in some areas in that area in regards to putting in the infrastructure for uh, water sewer. So there's a lot going on for sure. And uh, since this is an application, you know, it's, you know, it's the grants. It's like, they wanna see like, hey, this is how much money we're gonna put into this can you know we'll see if we get it i mean it's it's like if we don't get it you don't we you know the city won't have to use the five million dollars so now that there's various properties being operated through the city's private public partnerships in conjunction with hud homeward which covers a series of affordable properties now they are accepting applications at trinity departments which totals upwards of 400 dwelling units plus other areas around missoula as well so you can look at those resources human resource council hud Homeward, Valor House. I mean, there's a lot of institutions that really help vets for sure. Um, vets in Missoula for sure are very well taken care of. Um, but you do need to make sure you get into those right contacts, either with, you know, Valor House, which is like the HUD association with that. And, you know, they have quotes and people saying that they're able to save some really life changing amounts of money that allowed them to put their down payment for their homes. So up next, we have some artsy. Uh, stuff for your enjoyment. This is uh, Mark Gibbons, uh, Poet Laureate for Montana in this episode featuring uh, Lauren Graham. So without further ado here, here here's a poetry reading. Mose, the beginning of Mose. 1741. Dear Gracie, do you hate me for it? Mose smashes the yellow legal page into a ball and reaches for the dead cigarette whose smoke still lingers, clings on his hair and the bar bars of his cell and the one light bulb in its wire cage. Mose Peterson, bewildered in the Texas Department of Corrections, lost in the letter to the woman whose face swirls in his mind on the long days while the heels of his hands harden on a shovel handle and the sun darkens his neck and the back of his white uniform. He stares at the sunburn on the top of his arm and waits, thinking how the lights go out precisely at 10 and without regard. He begins again. Listen, Gracie, I just wanted... Look, Gracie, I won't bother. 
Dear Gracie, I... 1740. All right. Whistle. So there's a little taste of some poetry for you guys. Uh, jump right in, right in. And, um, you know, it is first Friday, which is the first Friday of October, which means there's going to be a lot of art installations. And boy, whew, do I have a lot of arts I'm going to be talking about right now. Kicking things off is Critical Con conversations and this is going to be hosted at the Hellgate High School Library and so this is kicking off because this is going to be happening from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. just because it's after school hours and they usually try, try to wrap up this is going to be at the Hellgate High School uh, Library and so uh, there are two uh, students installation works critical conversation students have created a dinner party of stories for you to uh, pursue and learn about topics close to them walk around grab snacks and engage in some conversation at this first Friday at Hellgate Library starting at 4 p.m. and then most of these events are happening from 5 to 8 p.m. in the downtown Missoula area and this is uh, one that's happening at the artist run gallery it's the triop it's uh, called this one's called dark work Enter an ambient netherworld of underground, like a cave or underwater dive, a quiet and restful place to just exist with this live soundscape accompanied by Jody Mosier, artist, uh, flute, drums, musician, all that kind of stuff. At Triop, it's an artist-run gallery featuring contemporary uh, experimental and abstract work. This is at 210 North Higgins Avenue, Suite 206. So it's on the second floor. You'll probably see a sandwich sign if you're going down Higgins Avenue. Then we have um, this next one. It's, uh, let's see, Past, Present, and Future, art by Alan McQuaylen. Um, so this one originally from Britain, Alan's photog uh, photographic journey began around the age of 10 when on a family vacation he saw a pond that inspired his natural ability to see light and composition. This then sparked an enduring passion with art and he began a lifelong experimentation with printing and the best technology to create the images he sought. Then we got Marge Dodge at Bernice's Bakery. They'll be showing a, co a collection of artwork from mid-century pillar of Montana art community, Marge Dodge, as one of the few female modernist artists of, in Missoula at the time. Watercolors of the majestic Montana country, uh, countryside. Bernice's Bakery, which uh, on the first Friday, it's going to be uh, at Bernice's Bakery. And, you know, this is a selection of eight over from over 850 pieces of watercolor and oil painting, pottery sculptures, and landscape drawings that have been discovered since her passing in 2003. Maya Moan, solo ceramic exhibit. This is at Wildfire Ceramic Studios. This show will feature a mix of platter, uh, planters, drinking, and pouring vessels. Uh, uh, forms focus on the sense of abundance, cozy, inflated forms that invite touch and use. Larger uh, charger platters are a canvas for more uh, detailed paintings that can be hung and admired or used in services. After all, what better challenge is there to fill a plate with food enough to share? With a mixture of underglaze and variety of color glazes, she strives for a layered imagery that creates its own tactile landscape of the surface of their many pieces. And so, yeah, you can guys can check that out. This is going to be at Wildfire Ceramic Studios. Then we got uh, basically Torrance. This is uh, three different artists, Zelensky, Abel, and Christensen. Torrance is a thrill to present an action-packed um, evening at the, artist, at the Arts for Downtown Missoula's first Friday Art Walk. This is going to be at the Confluence Center. On, uh, for, and they will be featuring Missoula-based artists with different takes on experiencing the natural world. Then we got Michael McCabe. This is going to be Imagination Brewing Company. This guy is, uh, uh, he's going to be, he's known as AKA Cowboy Quad. He's a quadriplegic artist who paints with his mouth. He is a resident of Missoula, originally from the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation. Please join us for the Imagination of the October 1st Friday event and check out Mitchell's exceptional artworks throughout the month. To Remembrance, um, it's Remembrance with a T at the beginning. A mixed media e exhibition focusing and honoring and remembering those who have gone before us, featuring Bev uh, Glukert, uh, Morales Bochairs, and Tana Ostrowski. Sorry about that, uh, if I totally mispronounced those names, which I totally did. And then we have Boundaries. This is at the Clay Studio of Missoula. Uh, Boundaries is an international traveling group exhibition and it will intent of building networks and community. The ex exhibition brings together the work of residents and staff at the Clay Studio of Missoula and the Metella Clay Center. This is in, out of Alberta, Canada and features over 20 artists working in the ceramic fields. This artist inclu uh, included will be exhibiting uh, internationally 
while uh, building important networks between Canada and the states, which may lead to groundwork for a fruitful future. In these last two ones that were coming up, this one is called The Magic Garden. It's a solo art exhibit. Uh, it's a new collection of oil paintings inspired by birds and botanicals. It's going to be at Engels and Valkers. Um, yeah, there's not much other information on this particular one, but it's going to be at the locations uh, downtown. There's a lot of things happening as well. Um, this one's going to be at the Pause Up People and uh, Cultural Center. Uh, Michelle Knowles, uh, through a diverse range of uh, artistic mediums, she explores native flowers and trees, drawings, inspirations from breathtaking landscapes and regions. As part of the first Friday event, Michelle will lead an interactive art workshop that is open to guests of all ages. Join for a series of watercolor painting where you have your own opportunity to create your own masterpieces inspired by Montana na native flowers. Don't miss this unique opportunity to connect with the arts, hearts and souls of our beautiful state through the eyes and talent of local artists. And so that concludes all your First Friday events that are happening uh, this weekend as well as other events that are happening this weekend as well because there's going to be happening. There's a lot happening. Um, let's le let's uh, take a breath. Whew. A lot of art. A lot, a lot of art. <laughs> okay, so the next thing I'm going to be talking about is uh, just uh, basic stuff that are happening in your terms of just uh, general events in the city of Missoula. Uh, I usually find these on MissoulaEvents.net. It's a great way for finding out what's going on in the city of Missoula, and I just usually kind of copy and paste, and I kind of talk a little bit about some of those events that are happening at the library and beyond. Lifelong Learning Center is doing an Excel course, so you can stop lying on your resume about being proficient in Excel. And so they're doing two different classes starting uh, at 8.30, so it's already already started, but I just wanted to mention that Lifelong Learning Center is a great way for people to pay to get certified in different courses and different uh, fields and trades as well. Museum Open Hours, Spectrum Discovery Center, starting at 10 a.m. The University of Montana Spectrum Discovery is open to all visitors of all ages to explore science through engagement exhibits. It's on the second floor of the Missoula Public Library. And while you're there, you might want to check out some of the uh, Tiny Tales and Story Time around 10.30 a.m. for kids who are just picking up books. Um, Missoula Food Bank, meal distribution from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Today, uh, usually on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they are open for the long haul. Um, there will still be open meal distribution, even though that the uh, there was a there's some shakiness happening at the, uh, the, the government shutdown issues, which they were able to extend for four to five days. So you'll be able to still continue using the food bank uh, and the meal distribution. Family fun time. So if you're interested in doing some indoor fun, as things are getting a little bit cooler, this weekend school should be one of probably the one of the last nice weekends in Missoula before we start getting all uh, gray, rainy, uh, potentially snowy, who knows. Uh, Missoula YMCA, Root Jacker Sports Center, Mismo Gymnastics are all uh, um, ideas for indoor activities, and 10 a.m. tends to be their indoor activity kind of times on most days. And then, as always, the recurrent event at the Senior Center, 11.30 weekdays at the Missoula Sen Senior Center. It is lunch at the Missoula Senior Center. Y um, yarns and Watercolor on the fourth floor of the library. Watercolor is back at the Missoula Public Library on the, in the, inside the Cooper Room. We also have yarns, as always, inside the Blackfoot Board Room. Lego Club. Second floor at the Missoula Public Library at 2.30 p.m. Young Adult, Adult Writers Group, which is also online, and you can find out more information at the Missoula Public Library, but also going to MissoulaPublicLibrary.org. Um, I almost said com, but it, they both kind of end up going the same place. So Historic Missoula's Red Light District presentation at the Cranky Sam Public House. Historian Sophia Etier will be presenting the history of Missoula's Red Light District, including information about the original businesses in the area of Cranky's and Public House, listen, learn, and abide with the uh, pub on First Friday. Someone had a word of the day for when they wrote the description. KBGA Botanical Garden for Missoula fundraisers starting at 5 p.m. Um, Imagination Newt Brewing Company on top of what they're already doing with uh, um, um, Mitchell McCabe. Join KBGA staff in the Imagination Brewing Company for a fundraising spectacular to help jumpstart a nonprofit botanic garden in Missoula featuring live music from Kyle Curtis Band and Red Onion Purple, not to mention delicious brews. Um, 17th annual Pray for Snow at Karis Park and even a fun of excitement. They'll enjoy you to harnessing the rich history of Pray for Snow tradition and celebrating winter on behalf of West Central Montana Avalanche Center. The party begins at 5 p.m. at Karis Park Pavilion in the downtown Missoula where their host festivals before it ends at 10 p.m. Um, Kyle Curtis Trio and Red Onion Purple, Imagination Jam Band, like I said, they're doing the fundraiser KBGA. Historic uh, Missoula's Red, uh, again with that. Uh, Ed Johnson live at Ten Spoon wi uh, Winery, Miscellaneous Music at Ten Spoon Winery, Edward Johnson. 7 p.m. karaoke at the Jack Saloon tonight at 7 p.m. Gravy Ladies, 8 p.m. folk music. Um, 
at the Old Post. Daisy Chain presents First Friday the VFW is doing multi-genre music starting at 8.30 p.m. Cash River Junkers is going to be at Union Club to wrap up your Friday night. So, so many things happen Friday. First Friday, arts events, all this other stuff happening on Friday as well. Um, but on Saturday, we got German Fest happening at the Karis Park. Um, um, but also, as always, we have the markets and such. And it's kind of like the beginning of the end because at the end of October is when most of the markets will stop running as the weather get turns down and people start being like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Some people uh, last until about September. I've seen some people who just kind of end up just bailing in October, mid-October to late October. So, um, and also I wanted to mention Homeward. Homeward does these kind of like extensive classes on Saturdays. They have these whole things and it's a, it's a great way for people to get invested in their future and especially when it comes to uh, financial independence and buying a home in general. And Homeward is a great organization that connects the dots for a lot of people who have no idea what they need to do in looking forward and buying houses. And this one is about financial skill building classes. So they kind of lead you through uh, ways to uh, learn how to budget and all that kind of stuff. So it's a great opportunity, Homeward. I, uh, I used them to get my house back in 2018 and I've been happier ever since. Uh, lucky too, uh, <laughs> women-led carpentry workshop, Mud Tool Library Carpentry Workshop, uh, October 7th. This is from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's happening Saturday and Sunday this weekend. It's sponsored by Primal Practice Chiropractic. This week workshop that gives an overview of variety of common carpentry tools and the opportunity to use them when you build your own project with the guidance of MUD staff and volunteers. Hole in the wall, hustle. Uh, the Potomac Green, uh, Green Oak Community Center is hosting a 5K, 13K in that particular area. If you're interested in running, Potomac Greenhouse Community Center starting at 10 a.m. is the 5K or 13K. Uh, museum tour is, at, as always, every Saturday at 11 a.m. They do museum tours at the Museo Art Museum. German Fest, like I said, it is the, uh, a season for excess to drink in a public setting. Gary Gillette will be there with uh, his uh, later hosen and the bands. So he'll be there uh, around 12 and will be playing pretty much all day. This is a 12 to 6 kind of event at the Karis Park. You can't miss it. Uh, Dance on Location, University of Montana, the School of Theater and Dance launches their 2023-2024 season with the most alternative annual concert, Dance on Location. This weekend, it's a free outdoor concert it begins at UM Mansfield Library Mall. Not sure if that's in front of the, uh, or between the UC Center and the Mansfield Library, or kind of in that annex just behind the uh, library near Shriver's Gym. So you may want to double check that, but they're going to do some free outdoor concerts starting at 12 noon, both Saturday and Sunday. 19th century gold uh, Burmese shrines, Chinese wood studio Sangrila. Oh, they're featuring uh, uh, recent additions to the extensive shrine collection. This 13th century Buddhist shrine uh, uh, gilded in 24 karat gold were sourced in Burma by the late brother John. Uh, wait, hold on. Who's saying this? <laughs> uh, Miss Friend, there's a lot of love in, in these pieces and they supply a powerful presence to the, 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 uh, the, the mm, sorry, uh, this is, this is written in um, first person, so it's hard for me to really advertise this. So in addition, the Burmese shrines will also be showing shrines and uh, devotional objects for the, from the personal collection. So this is China Wood Studio Shangri-La. They're getting a new uh, uh, gilded 24 karat gold uh, installation as well. So. Um, as always, every Saturday at 1 p.m., MCAT hosts a Saturday drop-in from 1 to 3 p.m. Kids get to do some stop animation, work on computers uh, in, a, uh, per, in a very productive way. And it's all about video editing and all that kind of stuff, and we're here to kind of guide them through this way. But we, we, we show them the how. It's up to them to create, come up with their own creativity. All right, introduction to nature journaling, Missoula Public Library starting at 2 p.m. Jo uh, join uh, Valerie Bayer and uh, Kathy uh, uh, Setter Devine. Um, in a Northern Rocky nature journaling for this introduction to principles, techniques, and joy of nature journaling. Learn to connect with a natural world using a, uh, using a journal, curiosity, and focused attention. Um, so they're, uh, they're master naturalists and they've been journalists since 2009 and they're gonna show you about what it means to be a, a nature journalist. Uh, open house and carnival at 
uh, founded the, at the UCCC, which is the uh, University Congregational Church at the University of Montana. This has been part of Missoula community for over 60 years. They're doing an open house and carnival, and it's going to be as first, uh, first as a private kindergarten in the 1950s, and since the 1972, a cooperative preschool. The curriculum of the preschool, while intentionally non-religious, reflects strong humanitarian and community binding values. An administrator and preschool board of directors oversees the preschool operations. So, um, Ghoul, Batch, Ghoul Bash is going to be at the Milltown Garden Patch. Uh, many bands up in the Bonner Milltown area. If you're interested in doing some Ghoul Bash, that's at Saturday at 5 p.m. Boys and Girls Club third annual Blue Door Banquet at the University of Montana's UC Ballroom. It's on the third floor of the UC. Um, they join the Bo Montana Boys and Girls Club as they dive into the fantastical realm of Dr. Seuss for the years of kid imagination theme. From Cat in the House to Lorax, the possibilities are limitless as your imagination. Put on the most driving blues and go all out with the Seussian masterpiece. Costumes are encouraged, but by no means required. Let your inner child run free as they celebrate together in support of the club and the incredible families they serve. The Jabbar Bari is going to be at a dance at Imagination Brewing Company. Um, Lucas Yatch is at Ten Spoon Winery at 6 p.m. Um, strumming, uh, strumming Bird, Vegavon, a trio as the Highlander Beer, starting at 6 p.m. playing some folk music. Tom Catmull is going to be playing at Sweet 2 with John Burnell and Larry Hirschberg. Blue Collar Band is going to be at the Jack Saloon at 7 p.m. Julie Pianos with Josh Farmer and Kyle Curtis at 8 p.m. Um, that's going to be at Stave and Hoop. Um, Missoula Folklore Society Contra Desk is going to be the Elks Lodge Ballroom. So, I, you know, uh, and also Solid, <laughs> solid state Sound Karaoke and the uh, Bulldog Lounge starting at 9 p.m. Westside Lanes and Fun Center. Whaling Aaron Jennings is going to be at the Union Club on Saturday night at 9 p.m. DJ Chris Moon every Saturday at 10 p.m. at the Badlander. And hey, Top Hat's doing more concerts at their Top Hat location. And they're going to be featuring uh, Cactus Cuts, a folk band at Top Hat wrapping up your Saturday nights. If you're interested in doing some, some kind of things for Sundays as it is becoming the spooky season, they're doing a friends and family workshop, Jack-O-Lanterns, starting at, oh wait, I don't even know where, when that is. Oh, it doesn't tell me where it is. <laughs> Whoops. Um, sorry about that. Let me see if I can skip ahead to my uh, Sunday because they're doing some jack-o'-lanterns um, starting at 10 a.m. Uh, this is the Clay Studio of Missoula. Okay, cool. That's where it's at. It's a Clay Studio of Missoula is doing a workshop called jack-o'-lanterns. Maybe make some clay out of jack-o'-lanterns. That would sounds interesting. Uh, volunteer tree planting in the parks. Uh, uh, they, uh, they're uh, meeting up at Lafray Park at 1 p.m. If you're interested in help plant and pr uh, protect trees in three parks today. Meet at Lafayette Park. They'll move on to Elms, Lester, and Bonner Parks. Bring your water bottles and work gloves, wear sturdy shoes, and be prepared for the weather. And then also wrapping uh, rattlesnake stories, Chinese burials and the rattlesnake. Visual Public Library is hosting uh, uh, a talk about all the, the Chinese cemetery that is um, located under uh, Mount Jumbo, and they still find bodies. It's kind of crazy. So Lee Fedrickson will discuss the history of Chinese burial grounds at the Lower, lower Rattlesnake, and they know about Missoula Chinese community and the burials there, the broader history and burials in Missoula, and how the burials have affected Missoula's subsequent development and memory since the late 19th century. And it's uh, starting at 2 p.m. And here's a fun fact. Uh, even when people, when the Chinese are buried, they're usually buried for 12 years, then their bodies are taken up and returned to their homeland. Um, um, to be reburied for their final resting places. So that's kind of crazy. Uh, like one of those things, and then there is a, a forgotten cemetery in that general area. And I spoke in length about it with uh, when the city council uh, addressed this for that um, memorial for the uh, Chinese cemetery. So those are the things happening um, in and around the city of Missoula this weekend w for your events. Um, I wanted to thank you guys for joining me this weekend, uh, uh, for joining me this morning, and I wanted to have, hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph. Take care, guys.